time it is. Marvin Devine. Hoover. Axel. And you know how we do. <laughs> yeah, I got the juice, yeah, I got the juice Big game cool, make them look like cool Always play cool, that's the biggest rule Fuck it, what they doing, keep on doing Good morning and happy Sunday and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Welcome to another live broadcast of Kidney Hub East Africa. I am your host, Steve Belcher. Thank you for joining us. Unfortunately, my co-host and Conrad, Moses, the Kidney Ambassador, will not be able to join us today. Unfortunately, he is having technical difficulties on his side in Kenya. So we hope he'll be able to join us later in the broadcast. If not, don't worry, brother. We know you're watching. Please come into the comments and comment and ask uh, answer questions. So today, this broadcast is going to be talking about risk associated with hemodialysis. And before I start, I want to thank the people that's watching from TikTok. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'd like to acknowledge them. Um, today's topic, as I mentioned, risk associated with hemodialysis is something that occurs really on a daily basis, but many patients don't realize that it may be happening. They may not be realizing. And a lot of times when you're on dialysis and such these risks start to occur, a lot of times the technician or nurse picks up on it or see it and corrects the problem. Okay, and then sometimes the problem gets so large or enormous that the patient's like, what's going on here? One thing, example, if your dialyzer clot, you could be asleep one minute, next thing you know, the technician is at your machine tearing it down. You wonder, what's going on? Is it time for me to come off? No, your dialyzer clotted. Oh, okay, you go back to sleep. but. When that happens, you want to find out why that dialysis clotted, okay? Because you're losing 
a good amount of blood there. So you want to know what happened that caused that to occur. Did you get your blood thinner? The air getting the dialyzer. What happened? Was my access working right? And again, a lot of times the patient is not thinking about this. They just want to come in, get your treatment, and go on home. But between getting your treatment and leaving, in that little space of time, Three, four hours, three and a half, three forty-five, three fifteen, four fifteen, four hours and thirty minutes. There's a possibility that some type of risk associated with hemodialysis can occur. Now, this is documented inside the consent form. You say, see, what's the consent form? That consent form is the form that one signs the very first day that you start outpatient hemodialysis, which you put your John Hancock on. And, and the form just to refresh your mind, is is it kind of structured like this? I, Steve Belcher, name a person who's on dialysis, have been informed that my kidneys are not functioning and that I need hemodialysis to sustain my life. I understand that while hemodialysis is a life life sustaining procedure. It is not a cure for kidney dialysis. I'm sorry, it's not a cure for kidney failure. The procedure necessary to treat my condition has been explained to me by my physician, and I understand the nature of the procedure to be as follows. Hemodialysis will clean my blood by pumping through a device that will remove waste and excess fluid. I understand that hemodialysis involves, among other things, the insertion of tubes and or needles. <clears throat> Excuse me, when we talk about tubes and or needles, this is the tube or the catheter and this is the needle. Okay. Into my veins or fistula or through a catheter and the use of artificial kidneys to filter my blood. I also understand that along with the hemodialysis treatment, I may need laboratory tests radiology, and surgical procedures to assure adequate function of the equipment and effectiveness of the treatment. Then it goes on to say, I have been, then this is the important part. Just like the others important to understand what hemodialysis is, this is the part that's that pertain to this show. I have been informed that the following risks, that's where the S, are associated with hemodialysis and that while such risks are not common, they're not common, however, one or more one or more can occur and be potentially life-threatening. So in between the, those four hours, four hours and 15 minutes, three hours, there are certain risks 
associated with this treatment. And before I move on, uh, we, we got a surprise, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, we have Brother Moses from, uh, from Kenya, the, Kenya, the uh, kidney ambassador, live from Nairobi. Let's see if he got his equipment fixed. Hi, uh, Brother Moses. Good evening. How are you? Ah, good morning, Steve. How are you doing? All right. Your volume is still low, my brother. All right. Yes. So just stand by and listen to the show. Um, I can hardly hear you, but what I can hear, I, I'll All try right. to repeat. But as we move on, um, our brothers and sisters here in the U.S. as well as East Africa may come and experience these risks that are not common, but one or more could occur and be life threatening. Okay. Look like our brother's having some issues. Let him get that straight. So, one risk that can be potentially threatening is bacterial and or viral contamination of your blood. Let me repeat that. Bacterial and or viral contamination of your blood, which may cause infection or bacterial infection of the blood cause sepsis. And when I talk about viral, I'm talking about like hepatitis B or C, HIV. Okay, this is nothing to play with. And now, unfortunately, the field of outpatient hemodialysis, the staffing has gotten even smaller. Even smaller. And so now companies are scurrying around hiring any and everybody to work in this field. That's why if you go to my page on TikTok, you'll see a poll. You got to scroll down some. You'll see a poll. Me asking, it's 10 weeks. Even if I don't care if it's 12. It's 10. I, I use the range. It's 10 to 12 weeks of training long enough to care for someone undergoing hemodialysis treatment. Now, I just went through one risk. That's the bacterial. And this is bacterial infection, viral infection can be serious. Even life threatening, especially if you got someone that's not paying attention and being mindful of what they're doing and changing their gloves and washing their hands. Now they can spread the infection on to other patients. See, one don't think about when they walk in the clinic, the door handle that they're touching to go into the clinic, the bathroom handle the handle going into the clinic. How many times are people washing their hands when they touch these handles? And especially if you got a, a catheter or even a, a access in your arm. If you're not washing your arm before treatment with antibacterial soap or they're not changing their gloves when they're cleaning your catheter, that's a sure sign that an infection can be uh, developed. 
So we have a brother, uh, Moses, back, but I think he's still having some issues with technical difficulty. And this, see, this is the thing. Over in Kenya and parts of East Africa, their internet is not the best. And so you can see why shows like this are very important to kidney warriors across the across the water. Because if no one is there, if we having a hard time sitting down teaching people undergoing dialysis here in the United States, staff sitting down and going over this stuff because of the shortage, what do you think is happening over in East Africa? A lot of people get lost in the sauce. So be if you're watching this show, and if you have a catheter or an access in your arm, and you're watching this show, just make sure when you go to dialysis, one tip I want to give you, but they got it at when you go to dialysis on the walls, many places, some may not, some may, but you go to dialysis and you got an access in your arm. Just, just please go to the sink and use the antibacterial soap that's provided if they have it there and wash your access. Really wash it. Because I guarantee you, when you go sit down, it's not like the old days when some of these places got the big alcohol swab. They only may have two alcohol swabs, maybe even one, and just strip. But not even really wash your access and use the circular motion to enter out to, to move the bacteria and germs away from the site where you're going to cannulate. So make sure to add a layer of protection that you wash your arm, at least you know that your arm is clean because you scrubbed it down with antimicrobacterial soap. Another risk that can happen, that's happened, and you've seen it across social media if you're watching, bleeding due to clotting problems or disconnection of tubing. We got patients going home. We got the staff taping them up. Want to hurry up and get them discharged, get them out. Bring in the next patient. Patient go home. Next thing you know, they wake up. It's blood on the on the pillow or blood on the on the sheets. Like, oh, where, where did this come from? He looked down. The tape is blood, is is all gelatin up, clotted up, and you don't know what's going on. You're like, oh my God, I'm bleeding. It probably stopped, but it could have leaked. What do you do for that? And you go home and you bleed and, and you're scrambling, trying to find something. Most of the time, people grab a, a towel and just put it on there like this, thinking they may have. That's the, the location where it's bleeding. But if you find yourself in that position, go to my site and, and check out the HELC, Home Emergency Lifeline Kit. It's designed for situations like that if you start to bleed at home. Now, if you got a catheter, there are times when you get one put in, you can bleed around the exit site post bleeding. Okay, so you just want to make sure you, you, you keep that dressing on. And if it's not coming through, make sure they change it and address it at dialysis. Or if you got, um, Dressings at home that you can get online. And if, if you feel like that you can take care of yourself, 
and you know how to change the dressing and do that, by all means do that because there's a lot of people who had catheters and when we go to change it, they say, no, no, I changed my own dressing at home. I'd be like, that's great. That's great. Because you're taking back your power. You, you know, you're not depending on the staff to do it, but for the rest of the people who don't do that, when you go to dialysis, just make sure when they're changing the dress and they got the mask covering their nose, not under the nose, because we all have bacteria in our nasal flares. That's why we put them over. So when, because we don't want to breathe down on the exit site that's going into your veins. Also, if you when you're on the machine, make sure that they're taping you down. Because if, if you go to sleep and you move, you don't want the needle to come out. Make sure they anchor it down when they had a needle. And we call it the butterfly method, where we put the tape under the needle and cross it over. And then make sure that they put a two by two over the site so you don't get germs through, through right here. If this is covered, at least you're a little protected than this being open, exposed like that. A lot of times they put it on and they put tape over it but you don't know where that tape's been. And that tape could have been on the floor, could have been on the counter. And the tape, the adhesive attracts germs. So be careful and make sure when they connect your, um, I'm trying to find the lines, but make sure when they connect these to the, to the lines that you, pull that is taunt so it don't just come apart because those are lure locks when they put the let me find it excuse me when you got the lines right here this is the venus when they connect the person to dialysis you know when you're sitting in the chair, you see us. If you get ready to hook up, we put the me we put the female into the male, and we turn this piece right here. That's on the line coming from the venous or the arterial. We connect it, and we twist it. Lower they call it lower locks, and you want to make sure. Say hey, talk the line. Make sure it's okay. Have them turn on it a little bit. Make sure it's connected. Because I've seen these come apart. People rushing and not paying attention. It come apart and your blood is spilling all over the place. So make sure when they connect these, this is the tubing that you can pull and that it's not going to come apart. All right. Another risk that can happen is something called hemolysis. Hemolysis. And see, like I said, you wouldn't know because, you know, a lot of people that's undergoing dialysis, they haven't uh, heard that word hemolysis unless you worked in dialysis or in medicine. But hemolysis is the destruction or the breakdown a red blood cells. Again, hemolysis is the destruction or breakdown of red blood cells. Now, let me tell you how hemolysis can occur. If the bath, like if the artificial kidney, right? If this right here, if the if the filters are, are ruptured, or something's wrong, the, the dialysis, say the bath is not supposed to mix with the blood when it's in this filter. But if it's somehow 
mixes with this blood, it can cause hemolysis. Um, another way, for instance, we had a case back in 2008 of a nurse that was putting bleach in the patient's line. She was squirting bleach right into this port right here. And it caused hemolysis, the destruction or breakdown of red blood cells. Let me see. I think we have a brother back, Moses Kennedy. All right, let me add him to the stream. Are you there, Brother Moses? Oh, my God. We are missing so much of his input. Brother Moses undergoes hemodialysis in Kenya. And he has so much that he can add to this conversation. But unfortunately, the internet over there is unstable. Okay. Another risk with hemodialysis is internal bleeding or bleeding from your access site. Internal bleeding or bleeding from your access site. All right. Now, internal bleeding can happen from infiltration when they put the needle in and they stick, they go right through your access and the blood that's going through your access goes through that hole where the needle punctured through and it goes into your the surrounding tissues in swelling, which is a hemo, hematoma or infiltration. Now, I'm sure many warriors that may be watching this program right now has experienced an infiltration or maybe your loved one. And it doesn't feel, it's not the best feeling because you feel tightness from the swelling. That's another problem or risk that can happen. Also, infections of your access site, either the catheter or the graft, which I already went over. Now, this is what they tell you in this form. When you first sign on, dialysis. But if you if you just sign the form and fold it up and put it in your bag or don't read it, you won't be aware of the potential risk that may occur. And that can be potentially life-threatening. Again, that's why we do these broadcasts not only for our brothers and sisters in East Africa, for our brothers and sisters here in the U.S. that may not even be thinking about risk of going on with their dials. They may think, oh, the dialysis people, they got, they got it handled. They got it handled. And that's far from the least. Because if you got new people just starting and you have a situation that occurs and they don't even know how to address that situation. They just started because we know the best, the best, um, you know, is through experience. Training is through experience. So if you go on, that's this person's first day on the floor. They got, you know, their clean scrubs on. They got the stethoscope around their neck. They just got out of training. Uh, they really wasn't into training, but they got through and now they out on the floor. They got the stethoscope and they out there, but they don't have a clue. And they say, and they put on, right? And, and next thing you know, say the patient went out and they unconscious. And if they never seen a person unconscious and they need to start CPR, but they like, You know, they 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 just frozen because they never seen this before. Then they say, you know, you got to push them out the way and 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 start 
doing what you got to do. Okay? This field is nothing to play with. There's no gray areas. There's no gray areas. Because that can mean life or death. Yeah, it may look like we're not doing enough after we put on. A lot of times, the technician or nurse, they go and, what, get on, you know, go sit down if they put somebody on and, you know, on their phone, whatever the case may be. Most of time, us nurses, we help out or put on. Now we got to go draw up medicine or go around and, 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 and do assessments and make sure that, your machine or the machine is set the way that the prescription calls for. You may be on a 3K bath, but the technician put you on a regular bath. You may get heparin and the technician forgot it. You may be, may be on a 400 blood flow rate, but they got still got you on 200 after they put you on and it's been 10, 15, 20 minutes later, you still running on 200 blood flow rate when it's supposed to have been up to 400. Thus doing you a disservice. Another problem. And I just talked about this. Well, no, I talked about infections of your access. Introduction into the bloodstream or your bloodstream. And one may say, how can air get in? And this is a closed system. But a lot of times, right, what, what happens, say if, um, say if the patient blood pressure drops, right? And the person didn't, you know, we 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 use these bags right here of saline to set up the machine. Now let's say this bag is is down to here, has this much fluid left in it, and you need fluid, you pass out. That person may not even be realizing that they don't have much fluid left in the bag, and they open the saline. And they, they they focus on your blood pressure because your blood pressure is like 69 over uh, uh, 56 or something like that. And then next thing you know, the bag is dry. They not realize it. Next thing you look, they're like, oh, shit. And the bag is dry. It's just the pump is pulling air now. And then the air gets into this filter. So the air got to get out. So it, it goes through the filter and comes through these lines to, to the person. That's why they had an air detector on the machine. And if that line is not in the air clamp and air goes down and it does an alarm or clamp, it can go to the patient. That's why we have something, a procedure called um um to intervene if you get uh, an air embolism to turn a person on their left side and put them in Trendelenburg. But if that happens to you and if the person who's caring for you don't know how to treat it, then what? So that's why I'm talking about this. So, uh, you know, hopefully it won't happen to you. But if it ever does and, and you see you got air going in, you start having these symptoms and they're not doing nothing about it. Hey, hey, put me in the Trendelenburg. Put me on my left side. So they can trap the air. Give you O2. O2 is oxygen. Another problem that can happen is cardiac arrest or shock. Let me see. I'm going to try to bring back our brother Moses again. Brother Moses. Can you hear me? Yes, brother. Please. I 
can hear you clearly. Yes, but we can't hear you clearly. Your voice is very soft. Can you put can the mic you. up to your up to your mouth? But I can't. I can hardly hear you, brother. I can hear you clearly. Yes, I heard you, but I can't hear you that well. I can hear you. <laughs> All right, brother. Just stand by, because we, we can hardly hear you. All right, I let uh, Brother Moses deal with that as we continue. So as I mentioned, another risk associated with this is shock or cardiac arrest. Now, I just talked about cardiac arrest, and a lot of times you don't know that's going to happen or not. You would not know. Uh, it's just something that normally happens out of nowhere. Okay. Now, when that happens, you want to make sure that the staff are familiar with cardio resuscitation methods, okay? Another issue that can happen, allergic or toxic reactions to drugs, solutions, the artificial kidney or equipment used during dialysis, especially uh, if you one that never got iron before, because some some patients are allergic to the iron, and a nurse give you some iron like a test dose. Then say about say about five minutes later, you start to itch and to have all these hives on you. I'm like where did this come from? Then you possibly can attribute to the medication, the iron. Same with the vancomycin or antibiotics. We have a lot of patients allergic to vancomycin. Same thing. We start getting on the antibiotic to treat them. And next thing you know, they're itching. Some patients may not be able to breathe. They feel like their throat is closing up. And this will be coming to give the Benadryl or diphenhydramine, IV. Because the, the, the Benadryl or the diphenhydramine is an antihistamine. So those are some of the risks that can happen to one undergoing hemodialysis. So let me also talk about some side effects that a lot of warriors who may be watching and no one may explain the side effects. And say you just started dialysis a month in, two, three weeks, two months. And you've been feeling good. And then all of a sudden, some other stuff start to occur. And you're like, where did that come from? Well, I want to read some other stuff that may have, have started. Right? And this just are side effects to dialysis. So again, this is also inside the consent form. And in this particular consent form, it says, I have also been informed that there may be some side effects associated with hemodialysis related to fluid and chemical changes during or after the hemodialysis treatment. Let me repeat that. You may not have been informed, but this is what this consent form is saying. That's what I'm saying. If they didn't go over this, they just say, here, we want you to sign because they want to help and get you on the machine. You know, they want to have them get your treatment started so they can hurry up and get out at the end of the day. But 
if that happens to you, make sure you get this a copy of this form and go home when you have time or at treatment. Read it and whatever you don't understand it, look it up. Google it. So it says, and again, you may be watching this and no one never told you about these. Uh, hey, what's going on? 19. No one may not, never told you about these side effects. And you may think it's from something else. You know, worrying you and, you know, you, you, you know, figuring you got other shit to worry about now and this. And you don't know what it is because maybe no one explained it to you. So let's get into it. Again, it says, I have also been informed that there may be some side effects associated with hemodialysis related to fluid and chemical changes during or after the hemodialysis treatment. So if some of your parents go to dialysis, your aunt, your uncle, your brother, your sister, your partner, and you at home and they just come home from dialysis and they're going through something. Uh, some of these effects I'm going to read, just know it's probably related to the treatment. Like I said, it can happen during or after the hemodialysis treatment. Now, some of the side effects are osteoporosis, electrolyte imbalance, headache. So if you get every time you leave dialysis, you got a headache and it only happens at dialysis or after, is you can associate it with the treatment. Nausea, dizziness, fainting, irregular heartbeats, decrease in blood pressure, or also known as hypotension or low blood pressure, muscle cramping, and mild confusion. So you're not going crazy or anything, if you experience any of these symptoms that I just named during or after your treatment. Again, let me um, refresh what I said. Osteoporosis, electrolyte imbalance, headache, nausea, dizziness, fainting, a regular heartbeat, decrease in blood pressure or low blood pressure or hypotension, muscle cramping or mild confusion. These are all side effects. Also, um, also, uh, that would be necessary for you to follow. Now, these are the side effects from not following the dietary restrictions. I mean, it, it would be your responsibility to follow those restrictions and failure to do so, meaning like if you eat a lot of calcium or phosphorus or potassium, this can cause bone disease, calcification of the heart. Now. I've seen a warrior on TikTok a while back tried to go get a um, transplant evaluation. And when he went, he found out he had calcification around the heart, which deemed him ineligible. All that starts from your diet. If you're not taking these binders or hearing this, in the long run, those calcium deposits can cause full blockage or calcification. Blood vessels and skin. I'm sure you heard of calcium phylaxis. We got to get patients when they do have calcium phylaxis. 
we got to give a medication a medication called um sodium thiosulfate hopefully it would help heal those wounds And even with potassium, if you eat a lot of food and potassium and you're not aware, that can cause cardiac arrest. So we got 15 minutes left. I'm going to move away from the risk associated with this to some complications that are associated with this. Let's talk about angina. Like Steve, what's angina? Stop throwing those big words in. Chest pains. If you don't have a history of it, Right? If you don't have a history of cardiac issues, here are some of the problems that can cause angina or chest pain during dialysis. Low blood pressure. Anemia, if your blood count is low. Anxiety. or undiagnosed cardiovascular disease. And a lot of times this chest pain and giant for lack of oxygen to your heart. So if you got low blood count, anemia, you don't have a lot of red blood cells, get that oxygen. Um, let's talk about one that I've been recently seeing a lot of at the facilities I've been working at, and that's a clotted dialyzer. And how you can tell, like, the dark fibers in the filter, a clotted filter. I've been seeing a lot of that. And what happens you can't return the blood for most of the clotted filters. Now you got to disconnect and throw all the lines in the filter, throw it away, set up a new one, and resume treatment. But if that happens to you or your loved one, ask them what could cause that? Why do they think your dialyzer clotted today and it didn't clot last week or it didn't clot Wednesday or Monday or it didn't clot last treatment? Why today? What ha What went different today than the day before when my filter didn't clot? Was it my needles? Did I get my blood thinner? Did air get in it? What happened? So let me give you some of the causes. Okay? Let me give you guys some of the causes that can cause a clotted filter. One, inadequate anticoagulation therapy or failure to follow procedure for administration of heparin. Bottom line, your tech or nurse did not give you your heparin. That could be one cause. Another one, you could have a clotting disorder. Number two, dehydration of blood due to fluid removal without blood flow. 
or a low blood flow rate. Say if you have a catheter and it's not working right. And they say, we gotta, we gotta turn your blood flow rate down because your catheter's not working. So when you're supposed to be on 400 blood flow rate, you're on 250 and you keep alarming and going off. So when every time that blood pump stop, that puts you at risk for clotting because your blood is not moving through the circuit. So you want to pay close attention to these things when it happens, especially if you got a catheter and your machine is steadily alarming. Because you know, when your machine continues to alarm and it cuts off, it stops your time. So if somebody go in and say, oh, I went on at 12 noon. I'm three hours. I come off at three o'clock. But you can't come in off at 315. That means your machine alarmed or it, it stopped enough for 15 minute for 15 minute of treatment loss. So depending on how soon someone comes and reset the machine and do all that, it, it determines. So if your machine is constantly going off, find out what's the problem. Another cause of... Uh, clotted dialysis is air introduced into the lines. If you get air in the lines, it can cause that dialyzer to clot. So what we normally do in that case is, is return blood if able to do so. We maintain the access line. Make sure there's no clots in the access line. We restart dialysis with a new line, new system. And we let the uh, physician know, and they may order hemoglobin or blood count. I was trying to see if we could bring our brother back on, Brother Moses. Hey, Brother Moses. Can you hear me? Yes, brother. I can hear you still. I, I know you can hear me, but we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. I can hear you properly. Now, I know you can hear me, but we can't hear you. Yes, I'm here properly. Let me, let me also learn. Let me also take this opportunity to learn also. Okay, stay up. I'll just mute you. All right. Yes, guys. Unfortunately, our brother, uh, the kidney ambassador, is not able to um, speak to where we're able to hear him loud enough. He's having some issues with his microphone and hopefully we'll have that resolved uh, by our next broadcast. But as I mentioned, the, the internet over in uh, Kenya is unstable. And so we try to get the best signal we can when we can. So, um, Another pro okay, I talked about blood loss. Uh, another problem, as I mentioned before, or complication is headache. Now, a lot of kidney warriors do experience headache either during or after treatment. And some of the causes for this headache can be the fluid shift. Okay, you gotta remember, we're trying to 
pour fluid out of your blood and repelling toxins and waste. So it's going to be a shift of fluid. Uh, also, dialysis disequilibrium. That is a slower transfer of urea occurs from the brain tissue to the blood. So fluid is drawn into brain cells, causing swelling. And that's on a like a, a micro level. Then you have high blood pressure that can cause a headache. Change in sodium level. These are just some of the causes. Not saying it's the exact cause. Anxiety, nervous tension. Also, decreased levels of caffeine over the counter or even street drugs. And I mean, we had one place I worked at individuals coming in for treatment under the influence of heroin. And we knew it just by their their behavior, their profile, and their um, history and physical that, that we read. And so a lot of this can be contributing factors for one to experience a headache, mainly the fluid shift, especially if you're trying to take off three and a half to four liters. That can be a big fluid shift. And you're trying to take that off in three and a half to four hours. And so some of the signs and symptoms basically is pain in the head or the facial area. And how we address that or intervene is uh, assess the cause. What's causing this headache? Okay. We only have Tylenol here. I'm not sure if in Kenya, Brother Moses, if they administer analgesics to you guys, if you have a headache like Tylenol or any type of aspirin, if they have it at the facility. Do, do they have aspirin that they give patients uh, Brother Moses at the facility in Kenya. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. All right. Say that again. Repeat that, Brother Moses. Paracetamol is available. Paracetamol. Paracetamol is available. What is that? Paracetamol. Is that an aspirin? Uh, it's a, it's a painkiller. Paracetamol. I can't hear you, Brother Moses. Paracetamol. It's called paracetamol. Can you hear me? No. Paracetamol. Barely. Yeah. Great explanation. What causes gas in the tummy after dialysis? Um, I don't know what causes the gas, but I'm sure, again, that could be one of the side effects of, uh, of treatment. Um. Actually, as I mentioned, uh, some of the side effects, it could be coming from the electrolyte imbalance. You got nausea. Um, it could be from the saline. It, it could be from a lot of stuff. It could be from the medication that you're receiving. I'm not sure what medicines you get. If you um, take in the uh, calcitriol. See, now they... For a lot of places, they stop administering um, medicine called Zimplar, the IV uh, uh, vitamin D medicine called Zimplar. 
in a little bottle. We give it through the uh, venous line. Now they replace that with uh, Sensopar, that green pill, right? Uh, or they may give you the calcitriol as well, those orange pills. And what I've been told, a lot of people have been experiencing um, gas or stomach issues with the Sensopar, which, uh, which another name is uh, calcitrate which are those green pills that they started giving people now in dialysis. So that could be uh, a cause of, of your gas. So I'm not sure what medicines that you may be administered during treatment. So uh, that was a good question because again, hemodialysis affects each person differently. You have people who go home and say they feel their best life. Then you got some people go home and say, "I when I get home, I got to go to sleep until the next day. Then I feel better. So each person is impacted differently. Um, where was I at with that dialogue? Oh, with the headache. So again, um, I even recommend if you do experience headache to bring your own Tylenol or whatever helps you because if some units may not even have that. I'm not sure what, again, I couldn't hear Brother Moses tell me what they um, administer for a headache. But uh, please, if you can, Brother Moses, after the show, write that in the comments. Um, wow, we didn't got about an hour now. So let me go over uh, one more complication. Because uh, we could go on for days. There's so many complications in this that I feel warriors should know. At least you should know. So if you go to treatment and you see somebody you don't know or they got a new staff member, whatever the case, at least you know what they know. So another problem is fever and or chills. Fever and or chills. Some people may have a fever and they, don't, they may think they got a common cold. And say if you got a catheter and you just started been dialysis a month or two and they've been cleaning your catheter and say they had they not changing their gloves or they haven't been washing their hands. And, but you don't know that because you just started dialysis. You think it's the norm because they always been doing it that way. But let's just say all of a sudden you got chills. You're like, where did this come from? And you may think you have a cold or the flu. And you're not thinking that it's coming from this. And next thing you know, you got go to dialysis and they about they take off the dressing and you got googly goop discharge coming out of your catheter. And let's just say the technician don't even realize that. And don't even address it. And they just wipe it away and change the dressing without telling the, the nurse. Now you leave out of here and you got a full-blown blood infection. You haven't been treated because the person failed to let the nurse know so they can call the doctor and do the recommended test that need to be done to see if you do have a Bloodborne infection. So let's again. This is the last one. Let's see what's the cause of fever and or chills. Infection. The causes. Infection of access or other source. All right. 
So if you got infection in your access or the catheter, that can cause fever and chill. A break in a septic technique, meaning if the people at the clinic uh, break in their infection control procedures, not washing their hands, not masking up, not gloving up, okay? Uh, dialyzer contaminated with bacteria. Yes, this dialyzer could be contaminated. The fluid could be contaminated. The bath, this bath right here that they use for dialysis can be contaminated. Okay. Um, also, introduction of pyrogen uh, or endotoxin. So pyrogen are fever producing um, substances. Okay, like you, it could be in a water, a pyrogen, or endotoxin, which are byproducts of bacterial cell wall disintegration via the dialysate, or when they used to reprocess these dialyzers, use them over again. So there was a lot of ways that bacteria or pyrogen uh, uh, could get into the filter through the water system. That's why we go back and do these checks and disinfect the machines and disinfect the lines with bleach and back, I mean, with bleach and um, other disinfectant to prevent this from happening. So some of the signs and symptoms of a fever or chills are temperature over 99, redness, swelling, or drainage at the site of infection, Temperature increase after dialysis is initiated or temperature increases after termination of dialysis. So we start dialysis and your temperature starts to go up because now the blood is circulating or the, the germs or when we return your blood, your temperature goes up. That's the possibility that you have an infection. Um, patient feels cold involuntary shaking or chills when you're doing this and you can't stop it's involuntary um hypotension low blood pressure uh power gym reaction usually starts within 45 to 75 minutes after treatment has started <clears throat> so if you feel this and you go to dialysis and this happens this is what the treatment or intervention should look like. And then we're going to uh, close it out. The nurse should be notifying the physician. They should be obtaining cultures or blood or drainage, meaning if you got a drainage from your site or your, your catheter, they should be using a Q-tip swab uh, to swab it and put it in a medium to see if it will grow any bacteria. Administer uh, medications as ordered, like antibiotics. Uh, avoid use of, obviously, infected access. So if the access infected, especially if from the graph or fistula, you want to move away from that, that site. In fact, they may even put in the catheter, depending on the extent of the infection. All right? Stop treatment. Do not return blood if this is happening during treatment. Or just start, especially if it's a pyrogen reaction, like from the dialysate. Excuse me. Um, you know, then we want to monitor the vital signs. Uh, again, obtain cultures from the dialysate. Uh, discard the dialyzer if it's coming from that. Um, and may have to send the patient to the hospital, depending on. Um, how high the temperature is. So if you start developing the fever or chills during treatment, ask them to take your temperature again. And if it's still not, again, and then ask for two Tylenols, if it still hasn't uh, gone away, tell them to call a doctor or draw some blood cultures because something's going on, especially if you have a dialysis catheter if you have one of these and you're experiencing um uh fever chills 
uh, temperature over 99, low blood pressure, shaking. And if you have one of these, it's definitely a possibility that that infection is coming from this. So, with that being said, again, I want to thank you guys for coming on. I mean, there's a lot of information, there's so much information, you probably get bored. But um, again, there's no other show or um, healthcare professional is actually going in, diving it into these problems or complications that could occur during treatment. So with that being said, going to close down the show on YouTube and Facebook, and then I'll close down on TikTok. I want to thank everyone for joining and watching this broadcast. Thank you for supporting Kidney Hub East Africa. Um, let me see. I'm just kind of hesitating because our brother Moses Kennedy just got back on. He's been getting kicked off. And so let me tell him, brother Moses, we're about to end this broadcast. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get any insights from you because of the uh, issues you're having with your microphone. So again, I just want to thank you for coming on and representing Kenya and um, anything you'd like to say and I can pass it on. All right. Thank you very much for this show, Steve. I don't know whether you can hear me, but I want to say thank you, all of you who are watching. Come again next Sunday. Okay. So, Brother Moses, would like to thank everyone for tuning in and watching the show. Please continue to do so, and he looks forward to seeing you guys next Sunday, same place, same time, Kidney Hub, East Africa, 1 o'clock United States time, 8 p.m. East African time, right here on Steve the Kidney Nurse YouTube, Facebook page, and the FIGO Initiative Facebook page. Brother Moses, thank you. And we're sorry that you experienced that problem. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday, and we hope to have these problems resolved. Uh, take care and have a great week, Brother Moses. All right. Guys, thank you for joining. We see you next week. Stay blessed and encouraged. And again, to all the mothers, happy Mother's Day from Kidney Hub, East Africa. God bless you and stay safe. Peace. Hello, I'm Darren. We have breaking news. More than 600,000 Americans have kidney failure. While the number of people with kidney failure is enormous, the number of people with its precursor, chronic kidney disease, is staggering. An estimated 31 million Americans, or about 10% of the US population. Diabetes and hypertension cause two thirds of all cases of kidney disease. One out of every three Americans is at risk for kidney disease and kidney disease is now among the top 10 causes of death in the United States. In addition, 
nine out of 10 people with early to moderate kidney disease don't know they have it, putting their health in jeopardy. Are you at risk? For more information, contact urbankidneyalliance.org. The life you save may be yours.